Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here to talk about the curious reputation of Seiji Azawa, certainly one of our major conductors, and he's still active. He just recently made a recording of like Beethoven piano concertos with Martha Argerich, you know, numbers one and two, the ones that she's done 500 times. And he's, he's out there. He's in Japan working with the Saito Keenan Orchestra for the most part. Um, he's quite elderly at this point, but fortunately, he seems to be okay. I just don't understand why he's so underrated. And so I propose to sort of review that phenomenon by way of preview to my list of the 10 best Ozawa recordings on ClassicsToday.com for insider subscribers. Now, if you are not an insider subscriber, please consider subscribing. There's a link right below this video in the description of it, or you can go over to ClassicsToday.com and sign up there. And that is my entire spiel, because most of you, I think, already know what to do. You only have to do it. Now, let's talk about Seiji Ozawa. Here's a guy who has a pedigree unlike any other. He was originally destined for a career as a concert pianist, but in 1950, after graduating from high school, he broke two fingers playing rugby, and that put an end to his concert piano career. Fortunately for us, he became a conductor, or if you don't like him, not so fortunately, but I think there are many reasons to like him. I really do. But after that, he started winning you know, young conductor competition things. And the first one he won was in Besançon, France, where he got a scholarship to go study with Herbert von Karajan. And from there, he was picked up by like Leonard Bernstein or something like that. Or no, from Besançon, let me get it straight. From Besançon, he wound up with Charles Munch. That's where he wound up with. And then he went to, to uh, Tanglewood, and studied with Munch and Monteux, and then he studied with Carrion, and while he was studying with Carrion, he caught the eye of Bernstein, and Bernstein made him one of the assistant conductors of the New York Philharmonic in the early 60s. You may recall seeing him on one of the young people's concerts. So he was, he was already there then. And so he studied with, he's one of the only conductors, I think the only conductor who studied with both Carrion and Bernstein, and Munch and Monteux, that's not exactly chopped liver, as they say in the biz. And from there on, it was just this, this parade of, of, of achievement. I mean, he was conductor of the Toronto Symphony, then the San Francisco Symphony. And then in 1973, he took over the Boston Symphony, where he remained for 29 years. And with, with any other conductor, spending 29 years in one orchestra would be considered marvelous. That's what we want conductors to do, to go someplace, to become a member of the community, part of the orchestra, shape it in their image. And he had an image. He was fantastic for Boston. He followed in the tradition of Monteux and Munch and Kusevitsky. He was very, very good in French music, wonderful in French music. He did lots of contemporary stuff. He commissioned works. He was wonderful in that whole early 20th century school, except for Prokofiev, where he made the most horrible symphony cycle ever with the Berlin Philharmonic on Deutsche Grammophon. Let's not forget that bow wow. But basically, basically, he was really good as a conductor in Boston. Uh, he was not known for his conducting of the German standard repertoire. He is a very fine Brahms conductor, and he's a terrific Bruckner conductor. I've seen him do the second and fifth symphonies and a couple other things, and it's been marvelous. I mean, first rate, absolutely first rate. So I'm a little at a loss as to understand why his career in Boston was so undervalued. I mean, all I, you know, I, I came in, you know, I was in my early teens when he took over in Boston, and and I just remember so vis vividly the nastiness, you know, talking about him, how much they couldn't stand him in Boston, and they couldn't wait to get rid of him after 29 years. Now, of course, most people sort of, after 29 years, it's time for a change. Nobody's going to argue that.
but he maintained that orchestra. They're still one of the greatest orchestras in the world. They still play fabulously. They did not evaporate or disintegrate toward the end of his tenure. He may have gotten a little tired of them. They may have been a little tired of him. Maybe it showed in some of the performances. I can't say. I wasn't on the ground seeing them live all the time. But the fact of the matter is, I mean, when, when Simon Rattle spent, you know, how long was he in Birmingham? 10 years, 15 years? I don't even remember. It was like the second coming of the Messiah because he stayed there. When Eugene Ormandy spent all that time in Philadelphia, everyone thought it was wonderful. So why was it not wonderful when Ozawa spent 29 years in Boston making fantastic records? Because we have the boxes. We have the Boston Symphony box. There's a dozen, and half a dozen Seiji Ozawa boxes that have come out on Philips and Deutsche Gramophone. And most of the stuff in there, except for that horrible Prokofiev Symphony cycle, is good to fabulous. There's just a lot of wonderful stuff. His worst recordings, in fact, were the ones he made with the Vienna Philharmonic much later for Philips. You know, some of the Dvorak stuff and things that were just, you know, no one needed it. It was just, it was just an excrescence on the rump of the discography of the universe. But he was really, really, really good. And I, I just think that I, I'm puzzled. I'm puzzled. And he's still out there. He's still around in Japan. He's where he's quite revered. He had a, a rocky relationship with the bureaucracy in Japan, actually. I think he was more successful here in the U.S. and then in Europe. He actually uh, founded the Saito Keating Orchestra, so he had his own group that he could work with because apparently, apparently he didn't get on quite well with the powers that be in the musical world there. But his family lived there, his kids were raised there. He divided his time between the US and Japan. And I, I think he's a fascinating character. Even more so when you realize, if you listen to the recordings he's made since he's made Japan the focal point of his career, since he started those extensive recordings that were on Phillips for the Saito Keenan Orchestra, which were not released in the West with any regularity, um, which is unfortunate because it doesn't give us an easy way to trace his growth as an artist. It's much easier if you're in Japan where his records are more of a big deal than they were here. But I think that part of the reason is just simple prejudice. I think that we have a genuine white male stereotypical sort of bigotry when it comes to the world of classical music. And I, I don't say that as a, you know, a woke person at all, or a politically correct person, as you all know. But I think it's true. I think you have to acknowledge the truth. We don't, we don't regard African-American artists as legitimate classical music artists. We don't regard Asians. Now we do, of course, because of the Chinese. And the, but when Ozawa was up and coming in the 60s and 70s, he was, he was a real serious minority, a huge minority. We don't, heck, we don't even value Americans. I mean, Americans are always second fiddle to Europeans. I, you know, you know, Leonard Bernstein was the first native-born American conductor to conduct to get the directorship of a major American orchestra. It's really phenomenal when you think about it, and kind of strange because it has nothing to do with musical quality, nothing whatsoever. Zubin Mehta is another conductor who's always been underrated because he happens not to be a Western European white guy. And it just seems to me that there's there's no question because if you if you let your ears be your guide, then you realize that that this this it's just a simple prejudice, and and really a, a terrible one that we need to get over, because it's musically unhealthy to judge people for non musical reasons. That's the bottom line. And the fact of the matter is is that if we truly believe our own can't, if we believe that classical music is universal and eternal and perpetual and it appeals to everybody and it has that 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 completely you know eternal appeal which seems to work pretty well because if you look at Japan which is not exactly a western culture they love the stuff more than we do and i would say they probably understand it in some respects better than we do so and and so i really have a feeling you know I mean, Europeans, sorry, my European friends, and don't comment, just listen, you know, have no greater claim to this 
than anybody does. And they have no more talent or ability or aptitude for it than any of us. It's all a question of culture and training. Now, if you grow up in the culture, obviously you're more likely to be familiar with the culture. But to make it a career, to do it for a living, you need to have the same schooling everybody else needs to have, the same training. And who had better training than Seiji Ozawa? I mean, really, it's really striking. And so I am really going to have a good time telling you about what I regard as his 10 finest recordings because there will be some surprises. There will be some discussion of his strengths and weaknesses, which are not entirely what you think. But most importantly for me is the fact that he really has been a questing artist whose style has evolved. And because the latter half or latter portion of his career has been almost exclusively in Japan and international labels don't think that things that happen in Japan deserve attention over here, we're missing out on a large chunk of his legacy, of the continuity in his legacy and how things have changed. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit too in the, in the insider piece. So I do hope you'll join me at classicstoday.com as an insider member to listen to what I think is going to be a very, very interesting discussion of Seiji Ozawa's 10 best recordings. I really would love to wonder, I really wonder what he thinks about all of this. I really do. He's a reticent guy. They did come out with a book about his, you know, sort of career as a conductor and whatnot that was quite interesting. I read it. It was translated into English. But, you know, he's, he's not gotten the credit that he deserves for what he's done. Of course, like all of these people, he's made way too many records, far too many records. And some of them are good and some of them aren't. The ones that aren't, people sort of take as exemplars of all of them. Well, that's silly. You have to listen on a case-by-case -case basis, and then we decide what the great ones are, and I plan to help you. So keep on listening, folks. Thank you so much for joining me. If you've subscribed to ClassicsToday.com, thank you so much for that. If you haven't, then please do consider it, and I'll see you all over there. Take care.